Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'll also give a little bit more of a background about uh, on myself. Uh, so I, I was originally trained as a designer in a school of architecture, very much like this, because I entered this building, I sold the little models, um, and it reminded me of where my undergraduate degree. Um, and then I uh, went to Carnegie Mellon, where I studied robotics and HCI, I got a PhD in human computer interaction, um, and went on to University of Wisconsin, uh, where I started an HRI lab. Um, and that lab is full of uh, brilliant students. Uh, this is our graduate students and postdocs uh, that I work with, it's a large group, but a productive and close team. And we have the mission of building human centered principles and methods to design robotic technologies and also to seamlessly integrate into the real world. So there are these two components to it. The first one is design, how do we design these technologies? And the second one is integrate, how do we integrate them into the real world? And I'll talk about what that means um, in the talk in a little bit. And then we're uh, located in beautiful Madison, Wisconsin. It's a little snowier than it looks like here. Um, but uh, it's uh, if you know where Chicago is, two hours west of Chicago. And we're stuck between two lakes. It's this body of land, um, very beautiful campus. Um, and uh, I, hope, I hope you'll visit and one day see it yourself. So what I want to talk about today is prompted by uh, this kind of observation that a lot of robotics, robotic products are somewhat failing. If you are following the news on robotics, uh, one of the things that's very prominent is that this robotic startup came up and then it failed. And that robotic product is delayed. And it's not making uh, mainstream um, markets. And you know this uh, startup is very promising, but we'll see what happens. And I say this not because I take pleasure and I very much hope that these products uh, succeed as people who are building these products are our colleagues. Uh, but it's an observation. It's something that happens, and I think that, that could motivate us. So um, I even found this master class on uh, by offered by Y Combinator on why why robotic products uh, uh, fail, uh, which means you know that there is really a serious thing going on. People are being trained and, and talk talk about this stuff. So what I want to posit is that the main reason for this failure is that we're lacking an understanding of robotic products as unique technologies, how we can design them and how we can introduce them into the real world. So with that sort of proposal, um, I'll ask this question of what a robot is. So what is a robot? So we'll talk about that uh, a little bit at the beginning and then we'll kind of lead into the research from there. To answer this question, I'd like to talk about the study that I did as a grad student many, many years ago. Um, I think I did this in 2006 or seven um, of a uh, of an observational study, an ethnographic study of an actual real world robot. At that point, I wanted to work on real world robots, and there weren't that many, so I wanted to see what these interactions looked like if there were any. So we found a hospital delivery robot. This is a robot that um, moved around in the hospital autonomously, took some things from one unit and delivered to another one. It might take mail, blood samples. Um, documents and things like that, and navigated uh, elevators and hallways autonomously. Uh, it encountered people, avoided them, encountered uh, obstacles, avoided them, um, and really kind of did its, its, what it was designed to do. Um, at, at the same time, it had chance encounters with people and also had interactions with people, and that's what I want to focus on. Um, there was a lot of data out of this, and we published this as a paper in 2008 at the HRI conference. Uh, but one thing that I'd like to highlight is this. Um, uh, a manager, nurse manager, lead nurse, uh, talking about how this robot doesn't have the manners that we teach our children. And that was really interesting, this word manners. And it's, this kept coming up in the uh, data uh, about how, you know, kind of they find it insulting that they have to get out of the way of the robot, where they have to serve a patient, maybe they're under pressure to go uh, to that patient. And then this robot comes in and it asks for uh, precedence, right? That was kind of, uh, you know, um, unacceptable for these people. And the conclusion from that was that Robotic products that are designed for these environments actually have, have to follow the manners and the norms of that environment. And at the time, you know, this paper got the best paper award because it was this unusual finding. Oh, wow, right? Is it really unusual, right? So if you look at any other technology, think about cell phones and theaters, right? When people started having cell, cell phones as ubiquitous technologies, we could hear them ringing and people doing all sorts of uh, unacceptable things with them. There had to be warnings about, hey, you can't do that. Keep your phone off, keep it silent. This Right, norms emerging around technology is actually pretty common. Think about when cars were introduced, uh, building that infrastructure for that, and also the norms around how cars should be used, how people should interact in traffic, 
as had really to be established over time. And now we're seeing the same thing being reestablished in self-driving cars, right? How are these cars going to adopt our um, norms and manners? And, you know, how is that all going to work out? You know, we have, so we still maintain our human communication abilities to resolve issues that come up in traffic, but with autonomous cars, we don't have those either. You know, how is that going to all work? But at the end, you know, what I want to highlight here is that uh, these these norms emerge whenever there's a disruptive technology. And, you know, we're, we're seeing that with robots as well. And going back to the study, I think the main findings here were that, you know, robots are fundamentally different from other products, right? That's sort of a high level finding. Under that, uh, they have to follow human norms of interaction. Um, these norms actually emerge and change over time through interaction with people. As people become more familiar with these technologies, they adopt to the technologies and technologies adopt to them. And that's why we're building them to do so. And then finally, designing these norms are actually very, very challenging. There is not very easy. So with these findings in mind, let's go back to the original question of what a robot is, right? Is it a product? Is it a character? A lot of people might approach it that way. Is it an AI? There's this new term that everyone's been using, an AI. Um, whatever it is, what I want to talk about today is that we can actually take different lenses to look at a robot as different things. And actually, um, these lenses might help us uh, build this technology in a more acceptable way. So the first lens I'm going to talk about it is a product. Um, so imagine those children um, learning something, working with a robot and really using it as a product, right? I'm using an iPad as a learning companion or a learning um, tool, or I'm using a robot. This, this feels very much like a product. The second lens is that it might be a tool. So think about the same interaction, but this time a teacher setting up a robot to work with a child. For that teacher, it's less of a product, it's more of a tool, right? What does that mean to design the robot as a tool for people to use? And then finally, a lot of people are approaching robots as platforms. Maybe you are an application developer. Maybe you're, you're building something and the robot is a delivery mechanism or a medium for that. And what does that look like? So what I want to talk about today is these three lenses as robots as products, robots as tools, and robots as platforms. And with each lens, what are the key challenges? How do we think about these things? And I'll map onto, the, onto those ideas, the research that we've been doing uh, in my group. And I'll only talk about the last three, four years of research. So um, hopefully, pretty recent things. Let's talk about the, the, the lens that robots are, are products. I think the question that I have here is, you know, how do we think about novel products? We think about, you know, I, if, you're, if you're like most people who work on robots, human-robot interaction, robotics, I don't know, other technologies, we think of these things as these are technologies, we want to advance them, we want to make them more capable, uh, we want to reduce errors and increase uh, capabilities, refine them, we think about them that way. But in the real world, when people uh, interface these technologies and companies produce these, it, it's a slightly different story. So um, there's this notion called the product life cycle. Uh, when people think about products, they think about these, uh, th this idea of a product having a life cycle, uh, having an introduction period, a growth period, maturity period, and decline period. And we can map different technologies onto this. So for example, MP3 players are on the decline. Anyone buying MP3 players today? No, because you know it's kind of embedded with other products. Turns out that it's a capability that most devices can do. TVs are apparently in decline. A lot of people are not watching things on a TV. It became very much a commodity, and people are not really seeing that as a product. Maturity is, I think we can put smartphones. It's a mature product, everyone must have one. And then, you know, we're constantly updating it, keeping it kind of, this, this is, a, I think, a whole mark of a very mature product. Um, and the growth side, we can see intelligent assistants, maybe collaborative robots, right? It's kind of growing. People are interested. They're adopting. We're seeing more. And then a lot of stuff that we are working on are self-driving cars, social robots, AI systems that we interact with are very much at the introduction stage. So when you think about robots as products, we're sort of in this very introduction growth early stages, okay? And I think that helps us think about it a little bit because uh, we can make this comparison that, hey, why can't my robot be like a cell phone? Well, it's not because it's not that le at that level of maturity, both in terms of people's interactions with it, expectations with it, and also what we know about the technology and designing them. The second idea I want to talk about is this uh, idea called product adoption curve. So there are different types of users in the market. And I think sometimes we think about the user as a monolithic group, but there are lots of different kinds of users. 
Um, starting, you know, let me start from this middle part, which is the majority of users uh, usually are split into early majority and late majority. Um, and, uh, you know, the, this is the biggest group who adopt the product. They adopt it on the early side. This is the next group, which is on the late side. And the laggers who may never adapt or very late adapt. And this part is the innovators, people who are at the forefront of things. They want to adopt things very early. Whatever's out there, they want to pick it up. Sometimes they may want to even modify tools. Um, and then there are early adopters. And one interesting um, phenomenon here is that there's this chasm they talk about, the gap between early adopters and the majority, where some products never make it there. You know, they get adopted here, people use them, it's there, but majority never adopts them. And I think you can see that robotic products are very much in the innovator stage and maybe a little early adopters. So that tells us a little bit more about who our users are. We actually have very forgiving users. These are people who are excited about things. They're gonna forgive a lot of the failures of the technology. Um, and I think the danger that we're facing is that we're never gonna overcome the chasm, right? Again, this is a helpful idea. The third idea I want to talk about is the consumer adoption process. What does it mean for each consumer to adopt a product? So when people are buying a new product, they go through these uh, stages. Uh, first, they become aware of a project product. They become interested in it. Okay, I think I'm, this kind of looks interesting. And then they evaluate something. Uh, they might say, I want to know what this thing does. What is it going to do for me? Then there's this trial period, which might be, maybe I bought it and I'm using it, but maybe works or not, you know, maybe I'll return this thing or maybe trying it uh, as a service, as a, you know, in the store here and there. And then eventually they'll decide that yeah, this is really for me. I will, I will use this or this is not for me. Usually people talk about these four, five stages. Some models also introduce this stage called activation, where this kind of the magic thing happens where the product does something for people, some kind of value is expressed and people really decide on adopting or rejecting. But this is a helpful thing to think about uh, how each individual goes through these different stages in adopting a product. And, uh, you know, I think we can say that most robotic products are still in these early stages. People are sort of building awareness. Uh, maybe they're building interest. Some people are. We saw from the previous model that it's mostly the innovators and early adopters. And then they are evaluating technology now. Very few people are actually kind of trial or adoption stage. Again, this is a useful idea for us. Um, so in this first group of work, what I want to talk about is in the um, products as, sorry, robots as products lens. I want to talk about our work that fits into these kind of stages of adoption. I'll talk about a little bit about how do I understand awareness, people build, building awareness of products. Um, how do we understand uh, different per perceptions um, uh, of products? Um, how do we build use habits? Uh, and how does activation adoption happen? And then there's some future work that, that we will be doing uh, that might, might look at other things. So, yeah, so those areas are what I'll talk about today. So the first one is understanding and supporting awareness. The question that we wanted to ask here is, how do people welcome a project product into their life. If someone got, imagine a child that got a robot as a Christmas present, what does that process look like? What do they do with it? And what do they expect so that we can support that better? Um, so what, what we did here is that we took a commercially available robot and um, brought the product to the children and then observed them as they uh, unboxed it and, and built that familiarity, really studied that process. And then we did a co-design session with children to design a new unboxing, new introduction process, and how do we actually support that? At the end, what we had was a, a process that uh, started with, um, uh, you know, the, the robot designed as a product, the robot actually sending the child a letter about itself so that the child would read what this thing is, you know, support that awareness, building awareness. Uh, I think this happened a week or a month before. Uh, the robot arrived, then children opened the box of the robot, and there was this introduction, they went through these activities to build a sustained use. So supporting that process of awareness and adoption was really at the heart of what we were trying to do. This is, uh, probably should have played this earlier, but uh, this is uh, children opening the current product, um, you know, opening, looking at the, um, the instructions and really what do I have to do? Um, and then at the end, we designed a uh, a box and experience that supported what really they wanted to see here 
And then at the end, what we had was a box that was a character of its own that introduced the robot to children and supported building the habit of those getting into those activities with children. So it helped children, okay, you can dance with the robot now, or the robot's not available right now because it needs to be charging and this and that. And we had a backstory where uh, the box was a retired robot itself, and it was helping out young robots to kind of build a relationship with children. Um, but understanding, you know, what it is that children expected from uh, products at the introduction, how they put awareness, and how do we actually support that initial awareness, interest, and evaluation uh, was what we were trying to do in this project. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is when people are showing interest, uh, what are they looking for? And if we're talking about uh, robots going into people's homes, we're talking about a multitude of people. There are parents, there are children, there are grandparents, there are I don't know, visiting students, there are all sorts of people in homes in this ecology of products. So what we try to do here, um, by the way, I forgot to mention that, but I have the students uh, who led that project in the corner. So this this uh, project was done by my student, Beng Sichaltai and Irene Ho. Uh, really brilliant students, is all their work, so I'm just talking about it. So anyway, so in this, in this project, what we wanted to do was to understand how different people saw robots as products. And we went through uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, co-design and scenario-based design sessions, introduced robots, uh, we did play acting. Um, you know, when we set up a set of props, introduced a robot and introduced this capability, these are what the, what the robot can do. Um, here are some scenarios to get you started to think about what robots might do for you. And then let's, um, see how you might want to interact with the robot. So children and parents, and we had a session where they were separate and I had a session where they were together, really talked about how the robot could interact with them uh, and how they could bring the robot into their current activities. And the main findings from this was that, the, that you know, these, um, their comments focused on the robot's role in the home. Some users were interested in it as more as a companion. They wanted to have interactions and conversations and exchanges with the robot. Others were more interested in, in it as an assistant. Maybe there are activities that the parents wanted the, the children to be engaged in. So how do I set the robot to actually do that? So seeing kind of this differential role for different uh, users was um, useful. The second one was there were different preferences for interaction, right? So how does the robot interact with them? Does it just show emojis? Does it talk? Does it talk in this language or that language, especially if it's a multilingual home? Um, and when should it talk? Should it just kind of talk like a child? A child would interrupt parents, for example, often. Is that what's designed for the robot? So we learned about preferences like that. And then finally, we learned about concerns that people had about privacy, confidentiality, things like ethics. If a, a robot is giving help to a child in an educational scenario, um, what does that mean? You know, do, does the child uh, kind of cheat when the robot is giving hints on an answer or, or things like that? So this was very informative in terms of understanding the initial stage of interest building for different people in a family environment. And the last one I want to talk about is how do we support that activation and adoption in uh, products? Imagine a product is brought to you, right? So this is the robot in a box brought into your family. Um, what is that going to look like? So what we're trying to do here is to uh, really see robots as in, in long-term interaction. So we first did in 2018, a two week long deployment, I built this robot system, it's an existing robot that we modified, uh, building an application with the robot read with children. Uh, it was a reading companion and uh, children read with the robot for a period of two weeks. We tracked how their reading was going, how they saw the robot before and after. So it was very, very informative. Then we did a four week deployment um, and here we saw different parents and things are a little blurred here, but uh, what this picture is showing is lots of people and their siblings and little children, cats, you know, everyone is kind of trying to, you know, interact with the robot. But one of the things that we saw here is that at the end of four weeks after that initial novelty period ended, there were different profiles of, of children. Some children were, uh, you know, interested in the activity they kept reading. They were so uninterested in the robot. Uh, some were... This is that picture. Some were, um, uh, you know, kind of disinterested in the reading, but they were interested in interaction with the robot. Some, their experiences got interrupted. They went on holiday, came back, and the robot was kind of abandoned. And some really enjoyed the activity, working with the robot and continue reading the robot, reading with the robot. So what, what you know, what do those um, factors look like? How were they actually shaped? What led to those things? 
this idea of uh, you know that relationship building being disrupted by a vacation or a family member visiting was very interesting to see. Uh, so it gives us some sense of uh, you know when robotic products are brought into a home and situations like this, uh, how are they going to be affected by these life changes? And then what we're gearing up for now. It's not going to happen for another year and a half is a much longer deployment and building a robot that can actually survive that long is the next year's challenge for us. Uh, but that's what we would really like to see um, to see how that interaction goes. And part of that is building uh, a lot of activities and really supporting long term interaction. What does that look like? That's what that, that's what we'll be easy, busy with in the next uh, year or so. So um, that's how I'd like to frame you know, interacting with uh, robots as products, how to design and see robots as products. The next one I want to talk about is uh, robots as tools. Um, so how do we think about tools? I think, you know, we, again, we're not tool designers. I've never designed a hand tool or any kind of tool. So I think we need a little bit of a help in thinking about how tools might work. And here you can think about social robots, collaborative robots, all sorts of other things. I'm going to focus primarily on collaborative robots here, but you can apply the same ideas to any kind of robot. So imagine this scenario. You have a worker using a tool to do a task, right? So that's the tool, that's the worker, that's the task. Turns out that this uh, um, task actually requires two workers coordinating things using two tools to actually do that job. And this is actually a scenario that we've been focusing on uh, in collaboration with Boeing and air aircraft manufacturing with support from NASA. And um, <clears throat> the ideas here are, are uh, manifold. One of them is when you're designing tools, and I think this comes up a lot in robotics, there's a trade-off between empowering users to do work themselves using the tool versus automating the processes so that the tool does most of the work. And then you can see that that changes how much control there is for people, right? So with high human control, you're thinking about worker empowerment using the tool to do the task using the tool, right? Um, with low human control, you think of more automation, the robot doing tasks, and that maybe humans are monitoring processes. Um, another idea I want to talk about is the productivity versus ergonomics trade-off. So when we have a worker using a tool, there's a point where you know, you achieve much higher levels of productivity, but it might actually be really bad for the worker because, you know, uh, you use a tool that's very powerful, suddenly it introduces a lot of vibration and strain to you, and that kind of starts disrupting the, the worker's work and, and well-being. And what this idea tells us is that there's actually an optimal curve, uh, if you think about ergonomics and productivity, where solutions lie. So what we want to uh, do is, put tasks on that line where um, you don't actually gain a productivity without uh, compromising from ergonomics. So it kind of informs you on, okay, well, I'm losing out on ergonomics if I actually try to make this more productive or the other way around. If I want this to be extremely ergonomic process, then I might be losing out, losing out on, uh, on productivity. So this is another idea that we can't just go for the most powerful, the most productive tool. We have to think about the ergonomic outcomes for the human, and that curve actually, this Pareto curve, tells us uh, where the best solutions might lie. One last idea I want to talk about is that if you actually look at uh, where robots are applied as tools, um, there's a trade-off between standardization and variability. So these are actual processes from uh, Boeing that we've observed. If you think about a process where um, there's very low variability, this is the fuselage of an airplane, the main body inside of which we sit. Um, so that's a very low variability process. All it, it, it is that it's a tube that's constructed. Um, it's a big surface. It's, it's easier to reach for robots. Um, and human expertise is not needed as much. You can actually uh, build the expertise that's needed to do this into the robot. So these processes have been automated very successfully. Uh, you can see this is called a quad bot because there are four robots building the pieces of the fuselage in an automated fashion. Very, very effective process. On the other hand, there are processes that are highly variable. Uh, so this is the wing of an aircraft, and here's a worker trying to sort through all the cabling and uh, wiring and the piping and all that. This is not something that's easy to automate, mainly because it's very highly variable. Each airplane looks a little different. Different models look a little different. 
Um, things are very hard to reach. Getting a robot like this in there is very hard. And then it requires a lot of human expertise. So if you think about uh, tasks that vary in this uh, spectrum, highly automatable, very low automatable, but how do we actually bring a tool into a world like this? And those are the kinds of challenges that I'll be talking about. The first one I'll talk about is, well, if I have collaborative robots, how do I even bring the person into the picture? How do we give them control? You know, when robots are introduced, they are generally given with a control. Here's a teach pendant or whatever. You can control the robot with this. Well, can we actually do these kinds of things, uh, these kinds of tasks that we're talking about using those mechanisms? And it turns out not much. That's one of the bottlenecks. So what if I wanted things to be so easy that I'm controlling this robot uh, as easily as I'm moving my own hand? Um, this is work done by uh, my former student, Danny Rokita. Um, most of this was done by him. Um, and what we did is that incrementally, uh, we explored this idea of bringing natural human input into the control of a robot to uh, control them in a very natural way. So I'm going to show three kind of increments of that idea. The first one is just like that video that you just saw, by tracking the person's wrist point, uh, can I give them kind of a very natural input method and then they can kind of see what the robot's doing. So there's this closed feedback loop. Um, so that uh, you have a natural way of moving things, seeing what it does, and then continuing that action uh, with that feedback of controlling things very naturally. With this method, uh, we call this mimicry control, naive users who never controlled the robot before could come and do very complex things like uh, playing with these tinker toys. Uh, we had them fold clothes, sort toys, open boxes, put things up, move them around. Uh, they can do very sophisticated things with a very simple uh, input method. Then we took it to another level. We said, what if this is a remote robot? It's over there, it's dealing with nuclear materials, or maybe it's on the moon or whatever, uh, but you can't actually be there. The feedback loop is broken. So what we did there is that we had two robots, one of which had a camera that gave a view of that robot to the operator. We took the two robots into the same optimization uh, so that when the operator moved that robot, you get the... Uh, the um, camera robot to provide you with the best view that it could possibly do. We did that with a, a set of heuristics about um, what kinds of things the operator might want to see. For example, if you're working in a confined space, you're not moving much, you probably need to zoom in. If you're making gross motions, you probably need to zoom out. Um, <clears throat> we later built an environmentally aware version of this. So the robot knew the geometry so that it would know to look inside the box from the top rather than the side and there are lots of variations of this that you can build. Then we moved into, well, can we do bimanual operations so that we can do actually more sophisticated tasks? Um, here we uh, trained a, a, um, a model to have the robot coordinate the motions of both arms. So we're not just transferring motion, but we're actually having the robot coordinate this motion to do these very complex tasks. Going from this very natural input to do kind of simple things very easily without any kind of training to this uh, more sophisticated manipulations. Again, this person had never used a robot before. They're coming in, they're just entering in. But this idea of, you know, how do I should give control to a robot, to a person uh, who's gonna use it as a tool in these scenarios uh, without training, very simple ways, you know, no teach pendants, no learning from demonstration, all very um, uh, natural input and, and uh, simple. The next idea I want to talk about is uh, tools for human-robot collaboration, right? It's not just we're giving control to the robot, uh, into the robot to the users, but how do we actually create a kind of a collaborative setup, the human-robot team, to address the kinds of tasks that I talked about at the beginning, where the aircraft manufacturing task and the human worker is trying to perform that task. Um, <clears throat> So we did a series of different uh, projects here. Uh, first, we looked at, well, what if I wanted to do this thing called uh, sh short term, short horizon uh, automation for tasks? Maybe I have a set of tasks that I want to do that are well modeled, but they're open ended. I don't know how many I have to do, and which ones I have to do. So here we built a sort of a, um, oops, sorry, which one should I first? Orders, so I'll start with that one. Um, so the idea there is, uh, let's say that I want to create a collaborative interaction with a human and a, and a robot. So the human has to do some part of the task, the robot has to do another part of the task, and I have to create a workflow between them. What we did here is um, 
used a paradigm called trigger action programming and created these hot zones. So I'm looking at the zones from uh, the robot's camera. So I would say, okay, I'm gonna call this a hot zone. If I see any object here, I want you to do the following action. So if the human performs their part and puts a part there, the robot knows that there's a part and then I should just do the action that I'm just programmed to do. And it turns out that if by doing those simple things, a string of simple um, trigger action um, kind of um, uh, parts like that, you can create very sophisticated programs. So let's see what that looks like. Um, so this is where the worker is saying, well, this is an area, whenever you see something there, please do this action. Um, and then let's go ahead. So the robot picks that up and it will put it in front of the worker and the worker will do their part and then put it back there. The robot sees it there and now the robot takes it and does its own task. So you can create a string of very complex actions this way. And this one is where uh, I was talking about this uh, short, ter short horizon automation. For example, let's say I want to unscrew a hundred different screws. There are lots of screws in there. I want to unscrew all of them and move them into a bin. Uh, you can actually recognize the screws and recognize what, what actions are available to them. For example, right, these are the screws. Let's, oops, sorry. These are the screws. Let's select them. Now you select the screws. Uh, the system knows, okay, this is a screw. You can unscrew and move them. So let's unscrew all of them and move all of them. Um, or let's say that I want to open all of these uh, drawers and check whether there's something in it that I'm interested in. So I can say, check all of these drawers, open all of them and look for this thing. So automating things like that. Um, unknown open-ended task with known actions, easy. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is um, a sanding task where we built this paradigm called correctly shared autonomy. Um, imagine that I have to sand a surface uh, that's a large surface. If I manually try to do it, whether a robot is sanding or a human is sanding, is sort of similar. You're not using the tool yourself, but it requires all of your attention for the other task. What we did here is that we provided an interface uh, one more time, um, where people can define a nominal task. Oh, this is the area that I want to sand. Please start your standard sanding. And the robot would stand the sand. And whenever the workers saw, okay, I need a little bit more sanding there, they would provide more controls to do more sanding in that situation. Then we extended this um, to multiple robots. Uh, and then there's a scheduling algorithm there so that when the robot through reinforcement learning learns uh, when it's a good time for the human to come in. So by scheduling the robot's nominal task to see when the, the human's uh, input would be most useful, you can actually converge into a highly efficient uh, multi-robot uh, kind of a work scenario. Anyway, so these are um, sort of ways of using you know, human robot teams, bringing them together and having people use them as tools in efficient ways. And the last one I want to talk about in this category is uh, tools for human-human collaboration. Can we use robots for human-human collaboration? Can they be a tool for that? And this is work by my student, uh, Pregada Privina, who's about to leave for a postdoc to CMU. Um, the idea here is that imagine that I have a physical task that I need to work on, and there's an expert somewhere that um, needs to provide me with guidance, feedback, or maybe evaluates me. So imagine this is my task of the worker. I have a helper somewhere. Um, and then there's a robot there that, that helps you know, the helper and the worker better see the environment and get feedback. So this is what the worker's space might look like. Here's the robot, and the helper is seeing through the camera on the robot. Let's see what that looks like. So here they're talking about objects. They're talking about location. Those objects and those objects are going to go together. The robot is kind of following them and providing the work, the helper with the best view. And the worker can actually also manipulate the robot. Well, actually, I'm talking about this, um, either by moving the robot or pointing at things and adopts all of those things. And this is what the helper will see. It's a different task, but. Um, so the helper is seeing where the worker is, and they're seeing the task a little bit more, following the helper much more closely. They're doing this, they're doing this. And all of this is facilitated autonomously by the robot by tracking hands, tracking objects that move, um, or looking at the, the helper's needs. Um, and this is an idea of using uh, robots as tools to help people cooperate. All right. So with that, I want to move to the last uh, idea, thinking about robots as platforms. All right, so how do we think about robot uh, products as platforms? And this is an idea that uh, has been actually successfully used in the past in other kinds of products. 
And it has been sort of um, some ideas that have been proposed for robots, but not successfully so far. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> looking back at some of the some of the products that have been released as platforms, I want to give three examples. Um, think about the, the iPod, right? So early 1992, the iPod was released and it was a very exciting product. But a few years later, people looked at it and said, well, this wasn't actually the product. The real product was that through selling the iPod, uh, what Apple did is that they started selling a massive amounts of music, right? So the iPod was just a platform to sell a lot of music. And that was a really interesting um, idea, interesting paradigm for, uh, for pro a product, a service uh, for a company to release, um, you know, uh, whatever they wanted to commercialize. And we started seeing that repeatedly. Think about the App Store, the iPad, the iPhone. These are again platforms. It gives a lot of creators uh, ways of developing applications, capabilities for these platforms for them to um, reach users, right? So these are all little products that are served on that big platform. Um, same thing is happening in the, in the web, or has happened. Uh, imagine WordPress as a platform, and what WordPress allows is end users can develop and they can build a website themselves and they can modify things. Or you can have professionals taking that platform and, and really fine tuning and modifying things for users. So all of these are examples of this paradigm um, called the, the creator economy. It's an idea that's been um, uh, uh, kind of emerging. People have been talking about it this way. Uh, there's even a tweet that I found. People are talking about how eventually everybody will be in the creator economy. And the way that people are talking about this is that there are different kinds of users. So you might have an application developer, you might have a content creator, you might have an end user. So, um, and then in uh, in building the technology, how the platform works is that there's an application layer, there's a platform layer, and there's a protocol layer. In the application layer, people are building applications. Imagine you have an end user, well, I just want to automate my home. I want to keep my warm home uh, warm. Um, you might have a content creator that says, I want a designer robot that talks like someone else, right? Or talks like me, my voice. You might have an app developer who wants to build new capabilities, and they might all use different kinds of robots, whatever the robot is, which is serving as a platform. And all of them use some kind of a, a backend uh, protocol to actually make those happen. And then, you know, app developers might interface with those. Content creators and end users may not. They might need some kind of intermediary. Um, and going back to the hospital delivery robot, one of the interesting uh, comments by one of the participants was, they wanted the robot to, when it entered the space, want to make an announcement, and they wanted to sound like one of their favorite singers, because um, that's how her husband sounded. But this is a great example of a content creator, right, building a robot that sounds like themselves. So you may have a package you download, oh, this is the ABBA robot, so it kind of makes announcements like that. Um, but so let's go back to, you know, what does this mean? How do we build tools to support this? How do we think about HRI research to, with this picture? Um, this is where we enter into the uh, idea of end user programming. So all of, we can think about all of these people as end users. They're not the designers <laughs> of the robot, the builders of the robot. They're the users of the robot for this or another reason, right? Maybe they're using it themselves as end users or they're building applications for other people, but it's all part of that um, creator economy. Uh, now, going back to this, how do we actually make this work? It turns out that there's a big gap in enabling these people to work with robots. And this is commonly known. Anyone, any grad student here who started working on robotics, there's probably a good six to six months to a year of you know, learning how to how, learning robotics, right? Basics of robotics before you can do anything. I remember I had a student who wanted to move a banana across the table. It took him eight months to actually get there. Um, so there's this big gap for all of these people, even application developers who might have the technical expertise to use these platforms for anything. For app developers, they might have this question of, how do I learn how to program robots well? I am a programmer, but I want to build applications, but this is a whole different creature. A content creator might say, how do I get my content into the robot? And an end user might say, well, I, I have expectations. I want to do something, but how do I build the robot or, or tell the robot to do that thing? 
And this gap can be filled in various ways. So um, I'll talk about in a minute how we fill this gap using expert models. Maybe the app developer doesn't know how to build a robot, but we have ways of looking at it. We can capture them, we can build it in a tool, and they can use that tool. This, and for content creators and end users, uh, we've been using formal methods to close the gap of, um, hey, you know, going from an idea to a program, uh, you don't have to know how to do that. We're going to close that gap using methods that uh, use automation or synthesis or, or learning and things like that. So I'll talk about the first one. How do we um, enable application development using expert models? The first example I want to give is, uh, imagine that I, I want to build a robotics application. Let's say that I'm an integrator. You know, if you know what, what that means, um, most of the time, a, let's say a business wants to uh, take a robot, a collaborative robot, they want to integrate that robot into their processes, they will hire an integrator who comes and analyzes that process and they will uh, make decisions. They'll say, okay, I think the robot should be placed here, it should interact with the conveyor belt this way, it should do this, it should do that. And then, um, and then they'll implement that, give you usually a turnkey solution and, and send you an invoice. What if I wanted, some of their, one of their engineers or whomever it is um, interested in bringing the robot to do it themselves. Can I capture the integrator's expertise into a tool and allow people to do that? This is exactly what we did. We actually interviewed um, expert integrators and captured what they look at when they are building tools like this and embedded that within a robot programming environment. Uh, so this was a paper that we uh, presented at HRI last year. What we have is that we have a simulation environment where we see a robot. We have a programming environment where we're building uh, programs through drag and drop and parameterization. And then we have these um, uh, feedback um, mechanism that is based on that expert model. As you build programs through drag and drop, moving things, the mechanism starts giving you feedback. For example, in terms of safety, it gives you feedback about pinch points and motion envelopes, and it might say your robot is, robot is moving too fast here, and we would recommend you slow it down this way. And all of this come from the experts. I mean, the idea of uh, embedding that expertise into a tool that people use to uh, uh, program a robot is really how we could close that gap. Um, people can see uh, um, the business objectives like, oh, the robot is actually going to be much slower doing the task than your workers currently and give you analyses like that. So we've um, actually brought this tool to businesses who were interested in bringing a robot and got feedback. Um, and that feedback portion is going to be uh, hopefully at HRI this coming year. Another tool that we built is called Lively. Here, the idea is, again, uh, I want to enter into building robot applications, and I have some technical expertise, but not that much. How do I actually help that person? Um, here, we build a, um, a programming environment for robots to create very sophisticated motion. So imagine that um, I have any kind of robot, and I want to move them in particular ways. Uh, we formalize different kinds of things, like setting different goals, setting different motion qualities um, and uh, generalize them so that you can bring in any kind of robot into it um, and then create a different access levels. Imagine you're a designer. What you want to do is animate the robot in a nice way. You could do it. Um, let's say you're an application developer. You actually want to hook it up to different kinds of capabilities. You can do that. We have an extend level where you can have API access to our uh, motion generation um, platform. You can do that work within the programming environment, see all the functions, capabilities happen, or and see you know how things visualize. Imagine that I want this elbow joint to move in particular ways um, with this motion profile, create noise in there so it looks more lifelike. Uh, we can add things like that. Um, and this was presented at this back, back March um, at the HR conference. Okay, the last uh, thing I want to talk about is using formal methods to close that gap that end users or content creators might have about expressing their intent, what they expect out of a robot into a robot. Um, and then here, you know, I mentioned how we use formal methods for this. We're, we're using particularly uh, program analysis and program synthesis. And um, I'll give you examples of what that looks like. And this is mostly work by my former student, uh, David Portfolio, and my current student, uh, Laura Stegner. So the four uh, examples I want to give, and there are additional examples we've created, but I chose these because this kind of shows a nice progression. Uh, the first one is building a um, visual programming environment. Imagine that I want to do drag and drop programming using 
pre-existing modules, uh, let's say that there's a greeting module, you drag and drop and you, param you update the parameters and the robot is programmed to greet you now. But I can create very complex programs this way. I can even create contingencies, um, uh, you know, different kinds of branching, and then uh, contingencies such that the robot, if the person's available, does this, not available, does that. So that's a standard visual programming environment. What we're doing here is that we built a, a, a program analysis backend so that it looks at the program that you're creating and gives you feedback. It looks for things like, well, that state that you just created, you'll never reach that state because you know, because of this problem that you can fix. Uh, or it might say, hey, the robot entering and doing this to the user might be inappropriate because of these uh, expectations that we modeled formally. So this uses formal methods because we can express um, certain expectations, task goals, or norms that I talked about at the beginning as uh, properties that the program has to satisfy. And we can check the program against those properties. If they're not satisfied, we can tell the user. Turns out we can actually fix them. So this is called program repair. Without even telling them in the background, we can fix a lot of those issues, and at the end, the uh, designer might end up with a better program. The second example I want to give is in uh, HCI, there's a method called um, body storming or experience prototyping, where you're designing something, designing a system, and the way that you explore the design is that you act like the system, or someone acts like the user, and you kind of simulate this interaction. We want to see if we can use that as a way to create the programs. Um, so, you know, we say, we tell people here, design teams, hey, you um, uh, pretend to be the, the robot, you pretend to be the user and have an interaction. You can have multiple instances of the interaction, we'll capture all of them and we'll create a program out of that. So there's a system called Synth and um, uses program synthesis. It takes every demonstration as an interaction trace and uses those traces to uh, generate a program. We capture people's speech, the intent that's recognized from the gestures, and these are the traces. Uh, using all traces, we learn an automata that can realize each trace that's been observed. And the users can go modify the tracer uh, traces, and then the um, program is regenerated and is immediately available to the to the robot. You can actually uh, simulate it on the robot, test it right away. The cool thing about this from, you know, which is very different from learning-based methods, they're fully transparent. You can see your automata, you can modify it, you see, you see exactly what's happening. You might generate a program and say, like, that doesn't look right, and provide additional instances or modifier instances, a very transparent way of generating designs. Um, so this was interesting for us, but um, as you can see that it's a little decontextualized. People are kind of interacting, but what happens if you're referring to the environment or go there and there's something there. Uh, so what we want to do next is to bring environment to that picture. And we built a system called Figaro. This time the play acting happens in a different way. You use figurines for it. You have a robot and a user. Um, you provide speech input and movement on that uh, surface uh, to express what the robot should do, how the interaction should go. Uh, you build a representation of the environment in that surface. You can say, you know, this is the countertop, the kitchen, the couch, the workspace, and I want the robot to go interact with the user this way using speech. <clears throat> That's a little speech show, showing up there. You know, robots say this, and then this way you can see, you can express how close the robot should get to the user. Uh, these figurines are also instrumented. You can actually push them down to express gesture or gaze, and you can assign that push down to any nonverbal behavior, but you can create very sophisticated things at the end. Um, we, thought, we thought this was very interesting to do, contextualize those programs that the synthesizer created in the environment. And the last one I'll talk about is another system that we presented last year called Tabula. Uh, here, you introduce the robot into your environment. So the robot goes and uh, discovers your environment, you provide semantic labels. This is my kitchen, this is my garage. And then you say, hey, robot, I want you to do this. I want you to, every time I go to the grocery store, come back, move all the groceries from the car to the kitchen. And then, uh, you know, using speech and uh, some kind of a touch interface. And what we found in working with these kinds of inputs is the speech is almost always uh, underspecified, especially when you're doing referential communication. Uh, so we kind of filled that gap uh, using some kind of a gesture input yeah, and then building, you know, putting those together as input into a program synthesis, very much like the one that you see there. Um, and uh, we just did an evaluation of this and hopefully we'll publish it in an upcoming conference. But this is very interesting because the first time we were able to see an end user using this kind of a programming, end user programming uh, tool 
to create kind of complex programs, map them to environments. All right. Great. So um, these are the three lenses that I wanted to provide. Um, before I end, I wanted to touch on a few more things, things that are going on, you might be interested in, like the, if you'd like to talk to me about. Um, this is a paper that's coming up where we were exploring how soft robots can be designed to be more expressive. Uh, we're using these things called uh, fiber embedded actuators to move robots in particular ways. Um, we're going to be presenting that at HRI 2024. Very interesting work. Uh, we also have some work in um, end, user uh, end user development programming in care settings. Uh, here, um, my former postdoc, uh, Emmanuel Stemp and Laura, uh, they're testing how a robot could deliver things to uh, people, older adults, and then really hear their expectations at that moment so that they can generate, uh, as, you know, they can use that as input into a design uh, system and then they can later autonomously test that. But this was very interesting. We call this situated participatory design, um, ended up being very fruitful and people have been using it, people have been reaching out to us uh, about how to use it. And the next uh, project that I'm excited about is this new uh, two projects that we're starting. One is on long-term interaction. I talked about this goal of six to nine mind deployment. We're gonna do that in family settings. A sister project is to study privacy in that context. Um, how do we actually think about the privacy of conversations and interactions within the home and with home and the outside? And there's a lot of uh, interesting questions there. And the last thing I want to talk about is I'm, I'm the director of a training program at the intersection of robotics and work. Uh, so I do a lot of work uh, working with companies and people from different disciplines, all the way from engineering to law to uh, policy to economics. Uh, to think about how robots and automation might be placed into the real world uh, and how we might train students to do that. This is very similar to the NMFS uh, program, uh, but this can be U.S. equal. All right, so if any of these is interesting, I'll be happy to talk about that too. With that, uh, let me end here. Uh, these are my wonderful current students, uh, former students. Some of this work was done by and my collaborators and funders. With that, I welcome your questions.